Yo, 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 good morning all! Happy Deepavali! Uh, so, welcome all! So, copy with ML. So, seems like today, like, gonna rain like that. Oh, it's a bit, uh, windy. So, I uh, just a quick talk lah. Uh. So, uh, yesterday, I covered the Chinese banks. So, the results were better than expected. So, hopefully, uh, to today, the price will hold up. Or it can recover a bit lah. Uh. So, uh, I originally thought that net interest margin would compress and that Q3 and Q4 earnings uh, would go down. But surprisingly, Q3 the earnings helped up uh, because uh, the central bank reduced the reserve ratio. So they were able to put less money with the central bank then they were able to do more loan. So lower margin but they make up for it by the higher volume. That's why profits helped up. So hopefully this trend will continue. Then maybe the worst is over. For, for the Chinese big banks already. So often I get comments is master how to uh, analyze banks like DBS, OCBC, UOB. Then I, previously I did the six category of stocks uh, like slow growth, high growth, dividend, cyclical, value, and uh, uh, which is a uh, asset play uh, and, and turn around. So banks is under which category? Okay, so today I'll do a short lesson on, on banks. So of the six category, right, banks is actually a hybrid. They, they actually form three different parts. So first of all, they are slow growth. Slow growth meaning because they are not a high growth. You don't see 20% uh, re revenue growth. Because banks at uh, the basic is they are the heart of the economy. So so example, our, our Singapore, our, our heart or that pump the blood so that they circulate across the body. So banks is the one that pump the blood to the economy by doing lending lending give you the car loan give you the house loan give you the corporate loans so that people can buy houses uh, build their family people can uh, get a car do sales do transport people can expand their business open more stores so they pump money into the economy by lending and then the economy grow so they grow along with your economy if your eco economy is two to three percent gdp growth then the banks probably uh, like five percent four percent kind of growth slightly like 1.5 times to 2 times the GDP growth or uh, that, that you, you can see that from, from the growth it means like the loan growth example the GDP is growing at 3 to 4 percent maybe the loan growth can be like 5 or 6 percent or the, the amount that they are lending out so there's a bit of a multiplier effect then secondly banks are actually cyclical in nature because the economy it doesn't grow one straight line there will be booms, there will be uh, recessions. So banks are actually very cyclical in nature. So uh, the, the other time that banks had a down cycle was 2008, global financial crisis. DBS bank crashed more than 50% and it trade at a discount to book value. Then the other time we saw uh, DBS bank crashing is like 2020, during the virus, during the lockdown, then Singapore had a very sh short recession. So during a recession, the banks, they sell down and they trade at a discount to book value during crisis situations. So banks are also cyclical in nature. But the good thing about banks is that in a down cycle, right, if the bank is very well managed, have high quality assets, uh, they do not uh, go into loss making. Some very cyclical business like oil and gas, uh, commodities, uh, shipping or even airlines in a down cycle they can turn loss making but for solid banks in a down cycle maybe their earnings uh, down 20 or 30 percent this is because they have uh, more bad loans i'll talk more about, about that later then lastly banks are also a dividend stock they pay good dividend usually for banks right like like now like dbs or they are considered more matured so they pay about 50 percent of their earnings out as dividend so their earnings is very important the higher the earnings the more dividends they pay whereas for the chinese banks because the economy is still in a high growth stage like five percent gdp growth so they need to retain capital so they retain capital so they can, they can do more future uh, lending so the chinese banks they are just paying out 30 percent of their earnings as dividend but generally for banks you can get five to six percent dividend you usually uh, usually at, at the current situation then even like for Malaysia banks, Malaysia banks they are super matured like, like Maybank, CI, MB, RHB, their payout ratio is much higher. Sometimes as high as 60 to 80 uh, percent. Because number one, they are very matured. Number two is because of their mandate. Their major shareholder is the EPF or 
the US Singapore we have the CPF pension fund Malaysia they call it the EPF so EPF right uh, they require the both the government owns this bank through EPF so the EPF uh, pension fund they require these blue chip companies and the banks to pay out more earnings as dividend they want a consistent stream of income uh, for their portfolio so Malaysia the banks the payout ratio is even higher and the dividend yield is like uh, six seven percent sometimes yeah so so uh, banks in basic are uh, is three three components they are hybrid they are slow growth they can be cyclical and they pay good dividend so it's a mix so banks are actually very easy to misunderstand for example like now now DBS is trading at 1.6 times earnings it's very overvalued it looks cheap at 9 or 10 times earnings it looks attractive at uh, 5% or 6% uh, dividend yield but it's actually peak of the cycle because it's a cyclical industry and over the past few years it benefited greatly or because of the uh, higher interest rate environment where their net interest margin expand they lend the money but they earn a higher interest rate uh, lending the money so banks right at heart right is they have two components when they make money there's the interest income and the non-interest income the interest income is very easy to understand you go to the bank you put a fixed deposit you get two percent interest every year so the banks borrow your money they pay you a two percent interest so they borrow at two percent so banks are doing a carry trade then they take the money they lend it out or be it a house loan a car loan they lend it out at four percent they earn the the spread is the two percent they lend out a corporate loan which is more risky five or six percent then they earn a three or four percent spread so they have a mix uh, car loan house loan or corporate loans so that's the basic business of banks they make money by borrowing money from depositors and lending money or uh, out so how much can they borrow and lend there's a multiplier effect based on their capital let's say i master leong bank my capital is one times so in the past pre global financial crisis they can multiply it by 20 30 percent or there's a reserve ratio there's a multiplier effect lah. but but basically in the past they can uh, they can leverage 20 to 30 times now because of the global financial crisis now they are more strict there's this baser tree or it's very complicated but basically their leverage have been reduced so banks generally they leverage eight to twelve times so every one dollar of capital they have they can borrow eight to twelve dollars and lend eight to twelve dollar of capital so they leverage or they do a lot of borrow lending and they earn a small spread or two percent they borrow at two percent lend at four percent they earn the two percent difference that's the borrowing and lending business but banks right the more lucrative business is the non-interest uh income or which that there, there's like credit cards wherever you swipe the credit card using like master or visa then you make right actually the merchant as example you purchase a hundred dollar product the merchant actually pays three dollar to the bank why because i know it i used to be a business owner so i hate master and visa i freaking hate them or i set up the terminal or i have to pay like what 2888 or set set up the terminal then there's a monthly uh, there's a monthly subscription then a, a yearly fee then every time people swipe i still must pay a three percent fee that's why some smaller shops right they don't have master visa they don't have the credit card function but they have the next function so credit card swipe three percent right is very expensive oh but that, that is very lucrative for the banks also they collect the three percent you spend customers spend hundred dollars they collect three dollars so they pay master and visa a, a royalty fee la. then maybe one percent goes to master visa the other two percent it goes to the bank then the bank take the money then they can give you the points the mouse all this so a lot of youth they like to swipe the credit card get the the bonus all this they actually get back their own money it's just a rebate only yeah then for the bank try right, there's the uh this credit card you can see that smaller businesses right they don't like to use a uh, credit card because the fee three percent is very high so they use nets nets is just one percent so nets is a monopoly it's controlled by dbs ocbc and uob and the fees is just one percent oh no it seems like it's gonna rain i'll change my location and continue okay let's continue so i'm uh, under shelter now hopefully it doesn't have a super storm or what uh, i think just some small rain uh so uh for the no interest income or oh, there's like the credit card there's nets which they earn a fee every time the consumers use the card to spend money also that's not interest income they also have insurance example for ocbc they now own a full stake in great eastern so when you go to the bank sometimes you put your fixed deposit 
But the banks they ask you, hey, do you want to buy certain product or like they can give you higher interest rate or savings product or three percent, four percent interest rate? But actually, that's an insurance product or that like an endowment or a life product which they earn a, a high fee. And then for the local banks, right? In the past, DBS and UOB they also have their own insurance business, but they try to become a more of a asset like model. So uh, DBS and UOB they sold away. Their, their insurance arm so instead of doing their own insurance they actually tap into an uh, insurance company to help distribute and sell their product so DBS uh, collects a yearly fee from Manual Life to distribute their product and every time they sell the product they earn commission on it then for UOB I think they help to distribute I think it's Prudential or AIA I think, I think it's Prudential I think yeah so uh, each bank they support uh, different insurance company i love the insurance business because it's like an oligopoly there are only uh, five players uh, in the singapore market that dominate or like great eastern aia prudential and uh manual life and also uh ntuc uh, income so j just the big big five players only so uh insurance is uh, actually a, a better business but it's not easy to run because uh, you must uh, manage your own investment portfolio so you want to learn more about insurance, you can look at my deep dive on Ping An Insurance. Insurance company, the return on equity is much higher. Ping An, every $1 of asset, they can generate 20 cents of earnings, 20% return on equity. So for the banks, right, the blue chip banks like DBS, OCBC, UOB, usually their return on equity will fluctuate from 10% to 15%. In a high interest rate environment like now, the return on equity can be as high as 15%. Then uh, for a down cycle when interest rates are low, then the return on equity uh, it can come down to as low as 10 to 12%. Also, they do make returns, but in the different interest rate environment, uh, their, their returns will be different. Like now the Chinese banks, their record low net interest margin, so their return on equity is just uh, 10%. Then uh, in continue on the non-interest income, so the other one that they make money is wealth management. So wealth management is actually very important for the Singapore banks. That's why you see that, uh, example like DBS, the return on equity is so high, 15 or sometimes as high as 18%. It's mostly because the wealth management business carries them. So recently we saw the saga this year on the anti-money laundering of those uh, Chinese uh, uh, folks. Uh, uh, they actually, they are, they are a scam and gambling syndicate. They, are, they, are wa they wash their money in, in Singapore. So the nickname for Singapore is that they are the uh, Switzerland or the Switzerland of Asia or to help those uh, unnamed uh, Chinese businessmen or hide their money, hide their wealth uh, in, in Singapore. So Singapore and Hong Kong, they are rival uh, in terms of financial help or to, to help service these wealthy clients. And by servicing these wealthy clients, we, they earn a lot of recurring income. Every year you earn a fee on their asset under management. So you do not have to use your capital. So this is a very asset-like business. Or you just need to build your branch. The most important is your reputation and your service. <laughs> then you can scale up uh, indefinitely. You just need to hire relationship managers. So last time I used to serve high net worth investors under BOS, uh, Bank of Singapore under OCBC, which is their wealth management arm for private banking. People which are high net worth, uh, we have uh, two, three, five million and above in, in net worth. So I used to serve those uh, clients. So uh, basically, you just need people to serve them. You don't have to use your own capital. And the more asset under management you have, the more recurring income you have. So generally, for, for banks, right, they have the interest income, they have the non-interest income. So interest income right, usually forms the bulk of their earnings. Usually, uh, it can be uh, at least 50% of their earnings. And sometimes it can be as high as 80% of their earnings. Non-interest income usually 20 to 50 percent. Like for the Chinese banks, right? Uh, Non-interest income is 20 to 30 percent uh, of their income. Most of their income comes from the borrowing and lending. Then for Singapore banks, about two thirds is the interest income. One third is from the service, the, the non-interest income. So for the China banks, right? Why their non-interest income is so low? It's because they have been disrupted. Uh, China is actually based in, in terms of like their financial system, right? They're actually more advanced uh, than Singapore. China since 10 years ago have the Alipay and WePay already. So what are these? These are actually digital banks. They are, they are fintech. So
so like uh, China there's no master and visa so the banks they don't earn the, the that much the credit card fees so China the payment is a dual poly they use Alipay they use uh, we, we pay to make the payment whereas in Singapore we use master visa or nets and now the fintech they are trying to disrupt uh, grab pay shopee pay but it, it might take maybe uh, many years uh, three to five years before master and visa uh, will be uh, disrupted so for the china right alipay and we pay these are called super apps not only they offer payment they offer a lot of service or like insurance and also like investment so the biggest money market fund the biggest place where you can park your money to earn interest is called the 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 zi fu bao zi fu bao uh is where you can example uh, and that's called yu er bao yu er bao means yu er means your remaining balance you, your example your ten thousand balance in the alipay every day they will pay you an interest and now all the fintech in singapore they are doing this you put money with the uh gsx uh shopee pay which is mari bank all this you get like uh, interest of three or three percent like that is what they're doing is the same as what uh, alipay is doing so they are disrupting uh the the not normal banks are and they do a lot of unsecured lending or which is like the like a credit card you can borrow money you can do the uh a loan facility so in uh china alipay they call it the uh what uh uh jie pay and hua pay jie pay means i lend you money hua pay means buy now pay later so fintech has already disrupted the china banks so that's why the china banks the non-interest income is much lesser but although they are disrupted right their core business remains very strong which is the borrowing and lending business because the if you're gonna do a business you're gonna take a five million dollar loan or you're gonna buy a condo and take a two million dollar loan you're not gonna go to the fin app like uh, the alipay or wechat to take a loan you will still go to the bank to take a two or five million dollar loan when you make a big purchase so this business will not be disrupted you will still go to the big bank and you're not gonna do it pure digitally you're gonna sign a lot of documents you want to ensure that you're not being scammed or into doing a uh, sign, signing anything that is uh, fraudulent so the borrowing and lending business will always have a place for the traditional banks so coming back to dbs ocbc uob right now they have a very high portion of their business is the non-interest uh, revenues so uh, that's where they might be disrupted especially payment and wealth management wealth management for example like the brokerage business in the past we use dbs because uh, uob kehen and the iocbc but now do you use those brokers no you use webu uh, tiger uh, and uh, mumu and now i'm promoting the long bridge so more and more competitors so the brokerage industry is very competitive and most of my wealth that i use it to purchase shares or i purchase etf is through these brokers so in china there's 100 over brokers and in singapore there are 20 over uh, stock brokers so it's very competitive it's a red ocean there is no mode and this is the area right that most likely or already they are already being disrupted then in terms of like uh, asset under management right there's also those robo advisor uh, like the scythe la there's also the mr lu pro promote the end hours la then the money hour la don't know still around or not so this is basically people can do the dollar cost averaging every month to put into etf or, or, or unit trust so this is disrupting the big banks their wealth management business so it won't be disrupted overnight it, it might take like three to five years the funds will gradually shift out of the traditional banks into this discount brokers because the fees are very cheap in the past i trade on dbs vickers ilcbc minimum 25 dollar commission now i use the long Beach broker to trade the singapore market the commission just two dollar only so cheap i, I buy the reads i buy uh maybe 200 dollar worth one percent commission i buy 600 dollar worth 0.33 percent commission so it's very budget i can bu do very bite size every month do the dca whereas in the past when i use a full service broker like rcbc or dbs vickers i must save like three thousand five thousand then I, I do a purchase then i pay the 25 dollar uh main commission yeah so now i think they will slowly be uh, disrupted but one thing good is that the insurance business is very difficult to uh disrupt the insurance business why because insurance is the reputation the brand is very important like for me all my insurance is under ntuc income 
and Great Eastern because they are the local insurance agent. They are so-called backed by the government in, in the past. Lah. So I'm very certain that if I buy a policy for 30 years or until I die, when there's something adverse that happened to me, I will be able to make my claim. So this is where the fintech cannot provide. If I'm a new fintech, like Master Leong Insurance Fintech, then I, I sell you the insurance product. I say, whatever product you have, I give you the same benefit, but you just pay half the premium. Will you come over to give me the business? You won't, ma. you won't, because fintech is loss making. You worry that two, three years later, my Master Leong Insurance go bankrupt. Then something adverse happen to you, like you get into accident or hospitalized, you cannot make the claim, because I already go bankrupt already. So when people buy insurance, they want to buy with an insurance company that is reputable, has been around for 30, 50 or even 100 years, like manual life, potential. They are all century uh, year old uh, insurance, all from, from, from Canada, from the UK. Yeah, then like, like Great Eastern has been around, I think for more than 50 years. NTUC has been around for more than uh, 30 years. So all these are the Lao Zhao Pai, la, old established brand. People trust this insurance company. So insurance is very hard to be disrupted by fintech. Long-term insurance. The only insurance that fintech can disrupt is the short-term insurance. Example, insurance for your maid, uh, insurance uh, for your uh, travel, travel insurance. So short-term one, you know that uh, you go, go for a trip, something happens, you lose your luggage, you can make the claim. So this is where uh, they can disrupt. So the traditional banks, the non-interest income likely will become worse uh, over the next uh, 5 to 10 years for DBS, OCBC and UOB. The second part is their interest income. The interest income, uh, like the borrowing and lending, will also become worse over the next 2 years because net interest margins will be coming down. So now at 1.6 times earnings, I think that DBS is overvalued. There is a lot of downside. I think it already topped at $40 already. Now it's at $38. I think over the medium term, it should trend down. I think, I think the fair value for DBS is something like $28 or $30. So there's an $8 or $10 downside for DBS, be, be worried. So DBS, right, usually you want to buy them right when there's a discount, when there's a discount to book value. So in the 2008 global financial crisis, uh, DBS, OCBC, and UOB crash. Why they crash? Because there's a global recession that started from the US. US, they had the subprime crisis where the property were overvalued. They did a lot of uh, very loose lending. They lent out the money uh, too loosely. And a lot of the, uh, the, the borrowers, they actually defaulted. Like the Las Vegas stripper uh, had five condominiums. Then, the, then in the recession, in the downturn, it, she's unable to service her mortgage. Then everything exploded. So subprime crisis is basically lending money to those American uh, uh, common folks uh, that do not have income or are doing freelance job, like, like, like the Las Vegas uh, stripper. So they are very loose lending. So this subprime crisis, right, the effect ripple across the world because the financial system was so connected. So one of the big brokers doing the subprime loan, right, is actually uh, Lehman Brothers. It's a 150 year old American bank. And Lehman Brothers sold this AAA mini bond. Even Asia banks, they sell it. DBS, OCBC, UOB, they themselves, because they borrow at 2% and they purchase the Lehman Brothers mini bonds, paying 5% interest. They themselves, they have exposure to this Lehman Brothers mini bond. They also sell this mini, mini bond to the uncles and aunties. So these uncles and aunties, they walk into the bank. They say, oh, we all found thing chi, we all found fixed deposit. Then the fixed deposit, the interest rate was very low, you know? just like 1% or 2% interest. Then the counter say, wow, you found this lease is very low, I'll show you a product, triple A, the no risk. That means triple A rated, no risk. You can get 5% interest, risk free. Eh? So this product is called the Lehman Brother Mini Bond. Mini Bond. Mini, minimum purchase is 100000 it gives you a 5% interest that it is risk-free, guaranteed by Lehman Brothers, the biggest bank in US, AAA rated, very diversified. So subsequently, the global financial crisis, which I, I might share more about a story on the global financial crisis in the future. So the Lehman Brothers, the 150-year-old bank, went bankrupt. Then the Lehman Brothers mini bond, right, the fair value, right, from 100000 dropped to $8. So 99.99% drop in value. Become toilet paper. You become worthless. So 
what happened is the banks suffered and they took a hit on their balance sheet. Secondly, those uncles and aunties, those retirees that bought the mini bond, they sued the banks and the banks had to make payment. So after a two year lawsuit and investigation and, and then the lawsuit, all this, right? That in, in the end, there's a forced settlement by the government. The MAS forced the three local banks to make compensation to these retirees that was uh, missold uh, these products. So if you are a full retiree like age 65 and above, you are return 100% of your funds. If you are like age 50, age 40s, your payment, uh, it can be like 30% to 70% pay payment. So it's, it's a staggered. Uh. So the banks suffered huge losses. So when you invest in banks, right, what is the major risk? You borrow at 2%, but you lend at the 4 5%. So that is the risk. Because you lend money, right, there's a risk that you cannot collect back your money when the property default, when the corporate loans default. So usually car loan and house loan right, is the safest because it's backed by asset. You buy the house, right? you put 20% down, 80% I lend you. If you cannot make the payment, I seize your house, I sell away. As long as the property prices don't crash more than 20%, you are safe. So generally, house loan and car loan, the interest rate is low, it's very safe. So UOB bank, they are very heavy on car and house loan because they are family owned, they are more conservative. DBS is very aggressive. They do a lot of corporate loans. So corporate loan, example, you lend to REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, Manulife REIT, or be it the blue chip REITs. So uh, DBS, they are more aggressive. That's why the return on equity is higher. The returns are higher. They, they do more of the corporate loans. They do more on their wealth uh, management. Whereas OCBC is stronger in insurance. So all three banks, they have their different style. So their risk to reward, the profile is uh, different. So. I hope this uh, summary gives you a good overview of the Singapore banks, the China banks. Also, if you like this kind of sharing, feel free to like and subscribe. The rain is go going heavier, so I hope you all have a good time at home. So happy Deepavali. Enjoy yourself. Then maybe Friday, take MC. Then super long weekend already. Take care all. Bye-bye. Good morning, Ginger Cat. Happy Deepavali. That's your hand. Oh, today can, can can touch her already. Never angry. Ginger cat, the cat, bye bye. Ginger cat.